So how can we imagine the success of a society? Um, and you might argue that you can do this by observing the luxuries that the society enjoys, such as a higher standard of education, better health care, and uh, the ability to put a large funding towards the liberal arts. Um, you could also argue that it's the size of the population in that society. However, even though that's a, like a decent way to do it, there's an underlying factor that controls that society's ability to enjoy any of that and have a large population, and that is the EROEI, or uh, Energy Return on Energy Invested, of the various energy production and agricultural methods in use in society. Um, my work with Dr. Kari is specifically focused on that of nuclear energy's EROEI. Um, my name is Devin Schustrich. I'm from the Minnesota State University of Mankato Integrated Engineering Department. And uh, I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for funding this research, as well as the RU program for accepting it. So what is EROEI, some of you may be asking? Well, it's the efficiency of any energy production process. And this equation here is essentially efficiency. If you take the lifetime energy output of that process and divide it by the net total costs during its lifetime in the form of energy, then you'll get a number that represents the efficiency of the system. If you take like nuclear energy, for example, um, in any given reactor's lifetime, it might output as much as 965,000 um, gigawatt hours. And that's quite a lot, but in order to output that much energy, there's a lot of energy that's expended in order to make that possible. And that is in the form of uh, several things, such as the mining of the uranium ore, the transportation of the, of the raw materials, um, including that ore, and the things that build the plants and what you store everything in, as well as the people <laughs> that work in all these facilities. And then an uh, extremely complicated and inefficient refinement process for this there. All of that can total up to 120,000 gigawatt hours, so divide 965 by 120, and you get approximately eight, um, which is <coughs> decent relative to coal <coughs> oil. Um, but this graphic designed by Dr. Charles Hall, who is a American He's an American. He's <laughs> 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 a professor at the State University of New York and oh, that's a systems ecologist, that's what it is. Um, this, it illustrates the importance of having a high EROEI in your society. So this is like average is on here. And as you go up from the bottom up, um, you, the society using this um, can support um, a higher quantity and quality of luxuries. Um, only once you reach a certain point can you stop just trying to support your family and like survive and then you can support things like education, healthcare, and the arts. Um, so overall it's really, really important to have high ERI in your society, low, like societies that have low um, average ERI suffer greatly. Um, for example, ancient city of Rome, uh, they had a, at the peak EROI agriculture, the, the, the capital itself supported a population of more than a million people, but through overuse of their soil, all their crops failed, and uh, the capital fell because everybody starved to death. So, <coughs> civilization will end if you don't maintain this. Uh, but this graphic here illustrates the relationship between the EROEI number and the useful energy percentage that you get out of that, that resource, such as uh, wind, solar, or nuclear. And that's known by this equation here. By dividing one by EROEI, subtracting about 100 multiplying the percentage, you get this. So if you have an EROEI upwards of 50, that's it's like 98% of that resource is going straight into uh, the power that can power devices like laptops and phones and that. Um, and as it drops down, you don't like notice a change very much until you reach about seven, and that's when you hit the net energy cliff. And at that point, 
that's not sustainable to keep your society up, and coal in that is at a two or a three, so it's not, not the best. So nuclear energy is right past that, and there is an issue with that, which I can explain later. Um, but you know, that's where I come in. Um, I'm essentially creating a program that automates the uh, finding of the REI for um, a, a large variety of parameters, um, and then find an optimum set of it, uh, like an optimum set of parameters that you can use to maximize your REI. But that's not really the focus. Um, Any questions for Jeff? Yes. Uh, what would be uh, um, what source of energy normally has a high REOI? Um, hydroelectric is very early relative to any of those. So nuclear is here, which is considerably higher than the majority of the stuff that we use most of the time. So the change though with history, I mean uh, coal is an extremely mature technology, I mean, uh, you know, as and when you get down here you've got, uh, you know, uh, solar uh, near the bottom, but, but you know, you would, you would hope that the newer technologies would be able to work their way up the scale as things are improved. Yeah, yeah. Um, through my research just solely for nuclear energy itself, you think that as technology improves, your reactors will become more and more efficient. Um, however, we're greatly taxing uranium as a resource, and that the, the refining process is so inefficient. You get you get like between eight and ten percent out what you put into it, and the cost for tearing down reactors after their life is like twenty-five to fifty years or so is much greater than like building it in the first place. Um, so what do you think? Technology is going to go up. The fact that the resource is running out means that it's going to hit like a peak and we're very, very close to that and it's just going to shoot straight down and that URI is going to... But I just have a comment on that, which is uh, there's other forms of nuclear, other nuclear technologies being developed right. which probably have higher, certainly higher efficiency in the extraction. There's um, traveling wave reactors, there's, there's um, new types of nuclear, there's breeder reactors, other types of reactors don't need to purify, uh, this is the U-235. Yeah. Um, so, but they're not in use now. So, um, the information I got is from um, research done by the University of Sydney, Australia, and theirs dealt with reactors that use uranium hexafluoride to like, extract. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now I was just saying there's some designs that don't need to do that, but they're not in common use. They're just in development. Right. The majority yeah. of the reactors use that hexafluoride. Right. Yeah. It's highly toxic. Could I comment on that? Yeah. yeah so these are sort of uh, what are listed by uh, in Hall's paper uh, are established technologies. So there could be game-changing technologies like fusion and things like that, which could totally uh, make this irrelevant, but uh, with the currently established technologies, this is the picture. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah, I'm not surprised to see ethanol corn down so low. I mean, this has been widely publicized, mm -hmm. and yet we are subsidizing this in a major way. And uh, so our policy makers ought to really be informed of a graph like this, so that they know where to put their their taxpayers' resources. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Adolf, I agree with you 100%, and that's my motivation to have started the minor in renewable energy, the physics 3400 course, right. <laughs> and giving these students these kind of projects Good. to to hopefully generate an informed population. Good. 
uh, I'm not influencing <laughs> 300 million Americans, but maybe one at a time. Yeah, one at a time, exactly. <laughs> we can go on this graph. Um, so you dealt just with the industry, but there are secondary effects that aren't included in some of these things. So, for instance, um, um, some of the uh, hydrocarbon stuff, especially coal, will have acid rain, other health issues, and shouldn't those costs be included in any kind of final analysis? Okay, so there's an environmental impact, and one of the measures of environmental impact could be EROEI, but this is a very narrow question only of energy returned or energy invested. A and the environmental impacts are not being considered at all. Of course they should be considered, and coal is a terrible fuel, all of that, but right now we are trying to uh, capture this sort of uh, EROEI measure to make the case that the technological impact is far less than people imagine it to be, uh, yeah, in terms of the newer fuels. But McConnell saw this, he would sort of uh, focus on what the Senate would do because coal is so highly rated in this picture. So uh, one of the things that I've, uh, I published a paper about a year ago on coal, basically saying that uh, American coal resources are overestimated by a factor of five. It's in the International Journal of Coal Geology. So we scientists are putting out the data, but if the policymakers choose not to read them or just ignore them, I mean, this, this is not much we can do. So, no, coal has a whole bunch of issues, and I've published at least one part of the issue. <laughs> so instead of 500 years of coal, we have 100? Barely 50 years, and we are post-peak in coal. But coal is terrible. Oh, it's yeah, oh, yeah. It's a major problem. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, but even if we, my case is, even if it were not terrible, we simply don't have enough of it. So, uh, yes. Now, for coal, uh, is it the way it's released that's energy efficient, or is it the fact that coal has such a high energy density? It's the energy density as well as the density of it when the earth is fine. There's not a ton of refinement that's necessary, but I just drink one of the solar and it's so, so I have plenty of experience with that before I was in the solar. It was glorious. It's not coal, but it's iron, so it's comparable. They're just holes in the ground. Alright. Well let's thank Devin again.